Um, good afternoon. It's good afternoon to those of you in New Zealand. It's 1.30 in the morning here in the UK. It's 12.30 p.m. in New Zealand. And uh, on behalf of FIP and, of course, our strategic partners, Press Reader and the Magazine Publishers Association of New Zealand, represented today by their executive director, Sally Duggan, welcome to the first session on day one of FIP Insider in New Zealand. Thank you so much for joining us. Of course, originally this was going to be a, a live event in person. Uh, we're not able to do that because of the ongoing coronavirus crisis, but we're really excited to do this virtually. Uh, we've been working on virtual events pretty much nonstop since the beginning of March, and we think we've got a, a pretty good show for you lined up over the next couple of days. And this is, in fact, the first full FIP Insider event that we've done online. When we put this together, we were very determined to ensure that we enabled both the knowledge sharing and the networking capabilities that make these events so popular, certainly when we do them in person uh, and successful. Most of you will have registered for this event on the Deal Room platform, and that's the hub for our event over the next two days. You can check the program and join sessions from there, but its main purpose is to enable you to meet one another. So through the Deal Room, you can book and hold meetings with any of your fellow delegates. And to do this, all you really need to do is look at the participants list and click the meet button at the bottom. If you send them a message, they will then suggest a time. And you can, of course, hold the meeting through the Deal Room platform, which has got video conferencing, uh, video meeting capability within it. Networking is a really crucial part of the event. And of course, we're in a time of great disruption in the industry, certainly in New Zealand. It's never been more important to expand your professional circle. So I encourage all of you to take advantage of this option and book a meeting with one of your fellow delegates. You might just find that crucial conversation that you need to grow your business. The Deal Room platform will remain open for about a week after the event finishes. So don't be afraid to book a meeting for later this week or next. Over the next two days, we're going to be hearing from a host of fantastic local and international speakers. They'll be giving us their perspective on the key issues affecting the market, both there in New Zealand and the broader media industry across the world. But before I introduce today's first guest, some quick housekeeping. These sessions are intended to be interactive and we're keen to hear from as many of you as possible. If you look at the bottom of your screen, you will see both the Q&A and chat buttons and you can use these throughout the event. Please submit your questions and of course, upvote questions from others that you would like to see answered and keep an eye on the chat box for useful links and information from the FIP team. Please also do feel free to contact the FIP or MPA teams throughout the event. If you have any questions or comments, I can be reached at james at fip.com and Sally Duggan at the MPA in New Zealand can be reached at sally at mpa.org.nz. Now, just before I introduce our first guest, a reminder that we've launched in the last few days the FIP Congress 2020. Uh, this is the first ever virtual FIP Congress taking place over the entire month of September comprising some 70 sessions, uh, world-class speaker lineup. So if you enjoy what you hear today and you want to know more, then please go to fipcongress.com. You'll be able to look at the agenda and book your tickets there. The FIP team will post links to the Congress in the chat box. Um, I'm delighted to be able to kick off our FIP Insider New Zealand event with a real international publishing heavyweight. Andy Clerman is the Chief Executive Officer and President of Active Interest Media and he's also an adjunct professor at the University of Colorado Communication School. He joined AIM in 2003, having previously been an SVP of Time for Media uh, at the a division of Time Warner AOL. So Andy, welcome to FIP Insider New Zealand. Thank you, James. I'm uh, actually very sorry that we have to do this virtually. I was looking forward to possibly a trip to New Zealand. We have over the years with our Warren Miller film business, sent countless numbers of uh, filmers down there for months at a time. So all I've ever gotten is the bill, but someday <laughs> I hope to uh, hope to visit. I know you have a lot of kindred spirits down there and things near and dear to our heart, like a lot of skiers and a lot of fitness folks and a lot of uh, runners and uh, golfers. And so uh, we feel very, very uh, aligned and uh, a lot of similarity, I think, with, with uh, New Zealand culture and sport. Definitely. I, I think we were all looking forward to that trip down there. And it's a shame we couldn't make it happen this year, but perhaps next year we'll be in a position to do that. Andy, before we get into the kind of meat of the discussion today, there's been some big news 
breaking on your side today, uh, a major deal involving some of your assets. Just tell us what's happened. Yeah, at about one o'clock uh, US time today, we announced that we have sold our outdoor healthy living, which includes our fitness group to a, another company here in Boulder that is aggressively looking to scale up their business with sort of a digital first uh, strategy. And they're a group that uh, we've known and worked with for a while. They're, they're here in Boulder as well. Um, so they will be, we will be divesting of those groups and focusing on our remaining uh, equine home and uh, marine businesses. And what's the kind of rationale behind that? What was the thinking for that deal? So we, we started the company 17 years ago with very sort of humble, modest beginnings with just a couple of properties. And over the years, through a lot of growth and acquisitions, we've done over 60 transactions. 55 of those have been acquisitions. Five have been divestitures. And, you know, continuously we're looking at the portfolio and the business and saying, where do we have opportunity to grow? How much do we have to invest? What are the priorities? Are they unique to that business? And in this mm -hmm. case, uh, with those groups, they really are ripe and primed for a big digital development investment around uh, memberships and audience development, mm. where we thought we had developed a lot of great businesses that surround those markets and those people, but that uh, this group that had a sort of war chest to go do that and a digital first strategy uh, might be a better steward of those for you know the next generation. Yeah. An another example that uh, a couple years ago, we had built up our marine business to be the largest uh, group within the company. And the centerpiece of that was the company that produced the world's largest in-water boat shows, Fort Lauderdale, Palm Beach, Miami, uh, yeah. and a whole host of others. So we grew that to a point that the next frontier would be international expansion, mm. which was sort of beyond our investment model. And so we sold it to Informa, uh, the world's largest event company. And they have you know, now been following sort of the next, uh, next stage of growth with the resources and the uh, capital that they have. Yeah. So this really is giving those brands a, the best chance to thrive for the future and to grow into, into new audiences and new markets. Yeah, and I think the proof of that is all the folks who are here with us in Boulder will remain in Boulder. And they are going to uh, excited about the strategy and this, uh, you know, this next move. That's so fantastic. Sort of good, good news. Good news moment, not a, uh, you know, no bad news. Yeah, fantastic. That's great to hear. Um, we're going to talk today about the power of enthusiast media. I wonder if, if you can start by talking a little bit about AIM. Tell us about the brands in the rest of the group, the audiences that you serve, and maybe this is the point at which you can, you can share your screen as well and show everybody uh, some more about what active interest media does. Sure. Uh, so we, you know, we are a true to the core enthusiast media company and, you know, media very broadly defined in this day and age to include things well beyond what people I think historically traditionally would consider media in its legacy form. But we have uh, over the years built the business into notwithstanding what we just talked about today, but five different vertical groups uh, in order of magnitude at this point, we are very deeply vested in the equine sports business in the healthy living industry, the home industry, which is really specialty home. Uh, people are passionate about old homes, log and timber homes, uh, classic homes, home, home restoration. We are in the outdoor industry and in the marine industry. And, e and in each one of those, we have a fully, uh, a pretty well-rounded portfolio that started in most cases with the premier magazine brands, legacy magazine brands. And from there, we have built and acquired uh, a whole portfolio of events, membership services, online education, film and video, uh, and all variety of other products that, uh, you know, fit within those markets. And um, I know that you've got obviously a great connection with your consumers, but I think one of the unique things about AIM is that you also have this 
really interesting appeal to marketers as well. Is that, is that something that's been a real focus for you as a group? Well, we, we've, while well, we've always had uh, a fairly balanced business between consumers and marketers over the years, we've particularly as the, 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 you know, major disruption in the media business has been led mm. by the, the uh, move of advertising from traditional media to, to uh, digital media. And so we have been focused on driving as much as we can towards the consumer, towards our consumers, while continuing mm. to, to balance that with serving marketers uh, with a whole raft of services be above and beyond traditional advertising, but everything from we've launched a full service marketing agency called Catapult and really tried to change the model from selling advertising to having a full service relationship that might include uh, media products, of course, but agency services. But meanwhile, when yeah. we started the company, <clears throat> I think from a balance standpoint, it was about 80-20 advertising to consumer revenues mm. uh, coming from subscription and newsstand. And so through launching a lot of consumer focused products, membership programs, online education programs, uh, buying and building events, we've switched the balance of that. So now the majority or call it 60% is coming from consumers and a smaller portion uh, coming from advertising marketing revenue, which I think the, you know, the simple sort of insight there was that in every one of our markets, there are millions of consumers uh, and, and there are great brands that we do business with, but there are less endemic marketers than they are consumers. So if you, if you build the business with the consumer in mind first, mm. Both the, both the marketers will follow, but it is a much more dependable, stable, uh, distributed business. Yeah. And I guess we'll hear more about that later on when we talk about the impact of the coronavirus crisis and the kind of benefit of having this much more kind of diverse sources of revenue. But I think one of the things that everybody will be interested in, particularly the New Zealand um, audience now, is the story of the growth of the company. There are a number of uh, magazine brands in the New Zealand market, which are potentially going into new ownership, maybe going into smaller ownership than they've been before. How long, and they'll be looking at, at AIM as a kind of example of success. How long did it take you to get to this point now where you're, you're this kind of very large uh, enthusiast focused business? This is our 17th year. We started in October of 2003 with mm. the acquisition of a small kind of uh, disparate portfolio of magazines that included things that had nothing to do with each other, like Black Belt in Martial Arts, Vegetarian Times, Southwest Art. Uh, so it took a good long time to figure out which markets that we wanted to really build the business around, how to make sense of those in terms of uh, creating a really significant footprint in things like healthy living. We decided not to be in the art business, but uh, we stayed in the home business. We built out into the outdoor business, as I said, uh, marine and equine. But uh, through the combination of acquiring these businesses that put us into adjacent verticals, we've really built up in, in looking at what are all the, uh, where are the consumers going and where are the marketers going? So that, that mm -hmm. led us to over over that 17 years of building out a very big event portfolio, launching a video film business under the banner of AIM Studios, starting a marketing services agency, as we saw advertisers looking for more full, full service solutions. Of course, you know, mo moving to every digital platform, there is launching an online education business, a membership mm -hmm. business, you know, it's, it's uh, it's almost impossible to remember at this point, but if you look, <laughs> think back to 2003, at least in the US, and I would imagine this is true for New Zealand, maybe, but the peak of magazine advertising, newsstand sales and subscription sales was the year 2005. Mm. There was no social media to speak of. There certainly was no monetization of social media. Uh, the internet was fairly nascent at that point. Mm. 
So we had a fairly simple business plan, which is let's build up a great enthusiast magazine media company. But as uh, we needed to reinvent ourselves kind of continuously, we've moved into all these other areas that have you know, turned out to be uh, great diversification as really the advertising business sort of never recovered post the big recession here yeah. in 2008. Yeah. And this, uh, you know, the latest, if you, if you, how, how you want to characterize the downturn now has been, you know, really a sort of a watershed moment for advertising first businesses. Yeah, definitely. I think that's the same picture we're seeing all over the world. And it's fascinating to see the breadth of things that you do. And we'll get into that a little bit later with some specific examples. I also want to talk later on about where you see enthusiast media going more generally. But I'm interested to know also in building the company, uh, one of the things we talk about a lot is corporate culture. So what's the kind of corporate culture that's been enabling this growth? You know, it's interesting when you start a company and you are starting with acquiring other businesses that may have had their own cultures historically, but uh, in, in over the years, I think the, the central theme and the central focus has been on innovation because it's uh, not to be overly dramatic, but I think in this industry, as in many, uh, it's sort of an innovate or die uh, generation for these businesses and mm. what what may have been work, worked and reliable dependable before is no guarantee of success going forward and the uh, the other aspect of that is you have a lot of people from who did not come up or or growing your own up through the ranks of traditional media companies needing to invite in a lot of people with different different skills mm. Uh, you know, potentially, particularly when you're talking about new forms of media that are, uh, you know, more popular and embraced and embraced by the younger generation first. So we, we've always had a ethos and a, a very strong commitment from the companies, not just, uh, not just coverage, but participation in all of the verticals we're in. So we really encourage our yoga folks to be actively involved in yoga advocacy movements and growing and promoting the sport and all the things that it stands for, like all the other all the other industries we're in. But this whole idea around innovation and institutionalizing innovation as a both a culture and a process has led to the development of all these new business uh, units, business streams, diversification where for the most part, all of the uh, new businesses we have built have come from some, you know, internal, uh, internal uh, development and insight, not some outside influence. It's a, it's a fantastic case study. And I think putting innovation at the center of what you do is very much a hallmark of AIM and what people know you for. And we're going to talk about some of the output of that innovation later. But I wanted to know whether this culture that you've built and the kind of innovative model that you've got um, has impacted, has been impacted by the coronavirus crisis. How, um, how have you been able to carry on working throughout this period? And do you see changes in the way that that's going to work in the future as well? Yeah, I mean, you hate to say <clears throat> there's been so many positive things in, in the, in the midst of so much uh, negativity and so much, uh, you know, so many people who are suffering in so many ways. Congratulations to New Zealand in tamping down the virus. You're a model for the rest of the world, but uh, we are unfortunately not a model for the rest of the world. However, it has been a radical, you know, accelerated change from people collaborating using new tool sets to, and I'm sure as we're doing today, everybody's in a similar mode, but uh, the speed at which we're able to collaborate using virtual platforms has, you know, taken, I think, things that may have taken months to develop as an, from a, an idea to bring it to market has happened mm. in, the, in the space of weeks. Yeah. And, you know, part of that is when people are not traveling, if I were to try to launch an initiative 
in the company and hold a uh, meeting of key leadership and their staff, it would take weeks just to schedule the meeting because people are hmm. traveling on sales calls, they're on assignment. So we've, we've launched two significant new products and services in the last 45 days uh, that were really born of insights we had around uh, what do we do now that certain, certain types of business, live events are not possible. Some of our industries were completely shut down from a retail standpoint. Yeah. So I think that's one, uh, that's one you know, major change. I think another is where we were moving, I think slowly towards creating virtual digital companions to events that we're doing. And James, you and I talked about this, where yeah. uh, we, we produce over 400 individual events a year and things like our Warren Miller film tour, which goes to hundreds of cities for a live movie premiere. We're now yeah. doing a major live streaming event. We have a major fitness convention of fitness trainers that happens uh, in the middle of the summer. We are now doing that completely virtually. So I think the expectation is that all these things that have been accelerated and launched as alternatives will now become companions. Yeah. And I'm hopeful that this will create a much bigger audience and participation in things where we didn't have as great or or complete a way for people to participate uh, if they can't be there in person. Yeah, uh, that move to virtual events, but also the acceleration of innovation is something we're seeing everywhere. And it's great to know that that's definitely been the case for you guys. Uh, just then thinking about audiences and the audiences that you go, you go after. So related to that question of innovation, how do you decide which audiences you're going to, to, to attract and what's the nature of your engagement with those audiences? So we, we've, we've used a, a, a similar filter as we've looked at opportunities over the years. And as, as I said early on, we found ourselves in a couple of businesses that we spent time working in and studying and decided not to uh, try to build up a business in those verticals. But it really starts with, is there a critical mass? And a critical mass doesn't need to be tens of millions. A critical mass could be a million people if they are really highly engaged in the activity. So for example, one of our biggest weird businesses is we produce the world's largest team roping events, which is part of rodeo sports. And that event business is really based on only 40,000 competitors. But those 40,000 competitors over the course of a year uh, contribute about $65 million to prize purses and, you know, are just crazy, crazy, crazily committed to the sport. So First of all, is there a critical mass of people who are really passionate about a specific hobby, interest, activity? Yeah. Is there a surrounding industry of endemic uh, product, services, education that people need for this? Is there a related, uh, related number of events and uh, places that these people gather and uh, can we facilitate that? And then lastly, is it relatively unoccupied territory? So I'll give, I'll give you two examples of things we have in past lives have been involved in and chose not to get involved in. So yeah. the golf business, all of that defines golf you know, beautifully. If you say it's big sport, it's international, it's got competitions, there's tons of equipment manufacturers, destination resorts. We used to own Golf Magazine at our own company but if you want to be a leader in the golf industry, you really are going to be sub to the PGA tour, sub to the television networks. Mm. There are major, at least uh, previously, there was major players of the world's largest media companies that own the major uh, golf media. So for, mm. for us to try to, to become a leader in that business, particularly as a company with a portfolio of interests, that seemed like a, major hill to climb if not impossible on the other hand there are certain sports that are not really occupied territory 
that fits some of that criteria, which, you know, bowling is always a funny example where there's a lot of people who bowl. And there's a lot of bowling alleys. Mm. But once you got your shirt and your bowling ball, you don't really need a whole lot of equipment. And uh, yeah. there's not a lot of uh, surrounding education instruction, a, you know, not really an economy around that, that we could then build a business around. Yeah. So you're not looking for pastimes, you're looking for, for things that have real passion around them. Yeah, and there's, you know, there's a, I think there's a bright line between, we don't really want to be in things, serving people who are marginally interested. We want people yeah. who define themselves by what they do. If you're a horse person or you're a skier or you're a boater, you know, that's how people define themselves. And that becomes the sort of the beacon for everything else. Just a reminder for everybody who's watching, because a few people have joined us just recently. If you want to ask a question, please do. Uh, we're taking questions all the way through. You can do that in the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And while uh, people think of their questions, um, Andy, I think one of the most interesting things about AIM is the way you look at your offerings, because these extend quite far beyond just simple content for your audiences. You gave some examples of that there. What are some some more examples of that that you can give us. I'm, I'm thinking particularly the equine stuff that we've spoken about in the past, which is a fascinating example of this. Yeah, so we, we have um, expanded into things that historically, in fact, when we were building or buying some of these businesses, our partners, investors uh, were confused to uh, not very encouraging until they saw how it all fits together. So one, one great example of that is <clears throat> we own a business called U.S. Rider. Mm. And U.S. Rider is literally the, I assume you have AAA in New Zealand, I believe you do, which is roadside assistance program for motorists. Mm -hmm. And so this is, this is literally AAA for horse people. And the, the insight here is that if you belong to AAA, which tens of millions of people do in the United States, and you are towing a horse trailer, if your truck breaks down with your trailer, AAA will come out and take care of your truck, but they won't touch your trailer and won't touch your horses. Hmm. So there is a opportunity there for us to come in and uh, provide that service, which we don't own any tow trucks. All of the services that AAA and all of the uh, car companies that offer roadside assistance, they outsource that to third-party service bureaus. Yeah. So this is effectively a subscription membership business and the, the real uh, expertise, core competency to make it work is in subscription marketing and customer service, which is something that we do very well. Yeah. So we bought this as a very, very small business. I think it had 5,000 members using the promotional platform mouthpiece we had with our equine media We've grown it to over 40,000 members in the last five years. And this is now one of the most profitable, successful brands within that equine portfolio. So that was uh, amazing. Another, uh, maybe another interesting one that doesn't seem immediately intuitive is we are now fully in the insurance business. So when we launched a membership program for yoga teachers, thinking yeah. that we had done a lot of research with Yoga Journal magazine and the brand and come to find out that almost half of the reader readership of that magazine are yoga teachers or aspiring yoga teachers, maybe surprising or not. So we built a membership around how can we better serve yoga teachers because they want information they can then pass on to their students. Mm. Then we come to find out that if you're a yoga teacher, you have to have, at least in the U.S., some level of liability insurance in the event that somebody gets hurt in your yoga class and sues you. Even though it is really bad karma to sue your yoga teacher, uh, they still wanna have some liability insurance. So we got into the liabil liability insurance business. Then from there, we started, we started to learn more about the insurance business. And there was some new legislation in the United States <clears throat> that allows like uh, people who are in similar populations in terms of avocation 
could buy health insurance as a group. Right. So we, knowing that a lot of our yoga teachers, fitness trainers, they're all independent contractors, don't have access to good health care, health insurance. In the last two months, we launched a health insurance program and are selling health insurance in addition to the liability insurance on top of the membership program. There's some fantastic examples in there of uh, the ways in which you're really thinking outside the box in terms of serving those audiences. One of the, the big things that the membership businesses now are thinking about and when you've got an engaged audience is the acquisition of that audience and the, the crucial kind of onboarding stage. Can you talk everybody through your approach to that? Sure. We've, uh, I would say the, I wish we were as uh, completely integrated and linked as this picture might <laughs> suggest. But, uh, you know, if, you, if I go back to uh, early days when we were trying to be everywhere all the time for all people from a media standpoint, and, mm. you know, suddenly in, there's Instagram, you have to be on Instagram, and there's Snapchat, and there's Facebook, and there's so we were, I'd say, sort of uh, producing content without having a clear path and connection between trying to engage people at one level and then moving them down uh, the level of engagement to try to turn them into partners and customers. So for example, uh, our websites, which initially had tons of free content and we have a huge amount of drive-by traffic, Yeah. Uh, you had to work pretty hard to sign up for a newsletter or to get a download. Yeah. So all those people were coming to us. We did, had no way to follow up with them, to engage them. So we've built a lot of those uh, sort of next level hooks into the continuum where someone comes to our website, they like what they see. Uh, we engage them with an offer of Newsletters are simple, but we've produced a lot of customized downloadable um, content. And then to get permission to market to them for all the other services we have. And, you know, this was always a ideal, mm. but it didn't really have a whole lot of utility until we developed this whole portfolio of paid products and events that we can drive people to. So for example, yeah. uh, we, got, we started producing online education for all of our audiences about four years ago and now have very, very significant libraries of online classes. And so take a, take a yoga class, for example, some of those might cost two, three, four hundred dollars $400, which if we can engage someone and turn them from a you know, website visitor to a magazine subscriber to an online education buyer, they will have spent uh, 15 times more money on one class than they would spend in subscribing to the magazine for 20 years. Yeah. And then you, once, I'm sorry, go ahead. So I was gonna say, so you've really got the opportunity to increase the amount of value you're getting out of each consumer. And this is, you know, this is, I would say not a traditional, it's, it's probably becoming much more ubiquitous, but this is not the traditional engagement funnel that mm. magazine media companies have followed. This is really what digital uh, companies use as, as rule of thumb. So we've not just uh, built it, but we've brought in uh, digital natives, digital marketing natives who've done this for a living for a long time. And um... From that and from that funnel, from the acquisition of audiences, you're obviously engaging with, uh, with them in a multitude of different ways. But I want to talk about two of the specific examples, uh, one of which we mentioned earlier, that I think are going to resonate with our audience. And the first one of those is consumer memberships, because that's such a big focus for everybody now, the DTC model. How do you approach this? How important is it to your business? It's, uh, you know, at the moment it is uh, in the, some, some cases it is incredibly meaningful. Some cases it's sort of early days. So I think mm. I mentioned before, our biggest, most established membership businesses are that U.S. Rider Roadside Assistance Club. Yeah. You have to be a member of our team roping leagues to compete in our series. We have 25, 30,000 members of those. The 
yoga teachers and the fitness trainer clubs where we offer the insurance and the liability insurance and the health insurance, those are very significant. So looking at how successful those clubs have been and how high the renewal rates and what the average revenue per member is compared to revenues we are historically getting from subscribers and newsstand buyers. Yeah. You know, really the major mantra is how do we turn a subscriber to a member? And yeah. what more can we offer to them that they're willing to, can we give them enough that they're willing to engage and uh, would they be willing to pay more for that? In some cases, uh, five to 10 times more than they're paying for a simple subscription. So example in woodworking, we have historically sold all of our woodworking products a la carte where you can buy the woodworking magazine. Yeah. You can buy access to plans, to video plans, so we bundled that all into a unlimited offering where for one price, monthly or annually, you get access to basically everything we've produced in the past and in the future. Yeah. Uh, interestingly, we still see our a la carte sales, particularly now, uh, continuing to, to track. We thought there'd be cannibalization, but they're, they're, uh, they seem to be working in parallel while some people like the all you can eat model and some people like the a la carte model yeah but i think this is you know in our minds this is really the future of and particularly because from a marketing standpoint if we spend the vast majority of our marketing dollars trying to sell a annual low price product i.e magazine subscription if we can transform that to selling a product with a lifetime value of multiples of that with a similar retention rate, we yeah. can then afford to probably spend a lot more on marketing. So there's a good virtual equation there of uh, if we can charge more, we can spend more, we can build a bigger audience and bigger business. I read somewhere recently, Andy, that um, one of the keys to success in membership businesses is that you have to reduce churn by constantly adding more and more kind of services and, and value to the proposition. Is that something you found? Yeah, and I, th I think some of that value, which we have learned is not just in the form of, <coughs> I'll call them static benefits, but it's actually in the form of engagement and special opportunities. So for example, if Backpacker has a base camp membership and yeah. uh, there was the two guys who you may have heard about who climbed uh, El Capitan and Yosemite, and there was a documentary made about it, Yeah, uh, the Dawn Wall. And so we had a members only uh, Q&A, a video chat with them, and you know, a huge amount of engagement. So offering these sort of uh, invitation only, they don't necessarily have to be major, you know, permanent benefits but i think the it's more about keeping people engaged and, and having them utilize their membership than just piling on more and more value yeah so making sure that they're getting real tangible benefit that they kind of remember the membership uh, for and they're, partici and they're participating yeah. yeah 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 they're feeling involved and engaged um let's then look at a specific monetization example let's look at e-commerce which is obviously on everybody's mind as well uh, seeing a bit of a boom in e-commerce during lockdown. How, how do you approach this? So this is, I, I mentioned earlier that in the last 45 days, we've launched a couple new products and services, and this is one of them, which this we're, we're calling, uh, and we're, we've got different names for it in different verticals, but we're calling it Gear 360, Fit 360, Health 360. So the the idea here is that talking and looking at so many people we do business with, so many marketers, particularly when retail brick and mortar uh, had limited or no access whatsoever, yeah. people were putting all of their, all of their eggs into e-commerce. So the you know, traditional sort of model we've had is we were selling advertising, which is building brand, which then drives people to both retail and e-commerce. And you know, how could we, at the, particularly in the moment, uh, help our brands increase their e-commerce sales. So the idea here is that um, 
there's a whole economy of reviews in e-commerce and reviews drive conversion, they drive sales, uh, consumer reviews, which are pretty, pretty um, ever present on e-commerce sites, but yeah. there's no place where you see branded reviews paired with consumer reviews. Yeah. So we've launched a service, which is much like the good housekeeping model, if you're familiar with that, where we will invite brands to submit products to our testing lab, testing group, and yeah. we will then produce a branded editorial review, which will combine with consumer reviews. If they want to use that review, we don't promise them that it will be a positive review. But if they want to use that review, they then pay us a licensing fee and they can deploy that review on their e-commerce platforms. We'll deploy it on our e-commerce platforms and structure a affiliate commission with them if we drive sales to their platforms. We also then publish it to Amazon because we have a relationship with Amazon where we publish branded reviews to Amazon. Yeah. So this is uh, this has taken off like wildfire since we've launched in the last two months, and it's a uh, you know has really and has the potential to be a game changer, which might eclipse even some of the ad revenues we're generating from some of these brands. That's fantastic, and is that all done on an affiliate model, Andy? So the direct licensing revenue coming from the brands, yeah, is. Uh, a service fee and then there are affiliate revenues that we receive from commissions from Amazon commissions direct from the brands commissions from other retailers that might be featuring these products so you have multiple multiple revenue streams that's interesting i've not i've not heard that example before where you've got 3 or 4 or 5 or it sounds like a lot of different potential revenue streams within the e-commerce offering that's a very interesting model i think um Let's just talk then about, we mentioned earlier, the coronavirus crisis. It's had an impact, obviously, on all of our lives, which is why we're all sitting here on Zoom rather than uh, seeing each other in person. What's been the impact for, for AIM overall? I mean, it was uh, certainly got everybody's attention immediately. And having not experienced this in our lifetimes, you don't know what the how things will uh, unfold. So our first order of business was battening down the hatches to make sure we were, we were solvent and could cover payroll. There was all, any number of uh, government business assistance programs mm. available in the US. We were not eligible, did not avail ourselves of any of those. But uh, as things started to progress, it was pretty clear that what we thought would happen that for the most case, a lot of our print advertising and digital advertising, you know, fell off immediately 30, 40, 50%. Yeah. But the counter to that, which we didn't expect, is that particularly digitally direct to consumer. So our magazine subscription sales, we're seeing record direct mail response, we're seeing incredible uh, orders coming from social channels. Our online education sales for all of our online education courses uh, were up dramatically. Our home, everything having to do with people at home with its, uh, our cooking classes or our woodworking plans, uh, all those things have increased. And then this whole e-commerce boom and putting products in front of that e-commerce focus. So that was, uh, and a lot of companies like us, I, I talk to a lot of our peers here in the US, they're seeing similar things if they have particularly enthusiast brands where people can still participate yeah. and purchase at home. One of the uh, most interesting things is I mentioned that team roping business and that is typically done on weekends. It can be hundreds or thousands of competitors getting together and competing and that was full stop when every state in the United States for a period of time was not allowing any events of any kind. So we dusted off an old idea that had been uh, kicked around but never launched, which was uh, letting people compete at home, live streaming their entry, their competition, and then we had people judging it uh, at the office or remotely. and. Within the first week, we had to shut down entries because we were effectively sold out. 
And amazingly through June, uh, that whole business is actually up year over year with the combination of now some live wow. events, but all of this live streaming events. Wow. Fantastic. So well, that was, uh, so that's you know, very we, much very much in line with what we've seen in other in other places around the world. I'm I'm interested. Uh, we've got a couple of questions from the audience, which we'll come to in a minute. But before we come to those, I'm interested in what you think the shape and timing of the recovery is going to be, both for the media market and more generally. Yeah, it's. Uh, I think there's going to be. It depends which category you're in. If you are in uh, travel tourism, it's going to be until there's a vaccine sports, live events uh, that can't pivot to some other alternative like live streaming. Yeah. I think that could be a U if not an L. Uh, yeah. Things where, you know, there's a lot of pent up consumer demand. We're already seeing this. So think, you know, particularly things where people are, uh, you know, the boat industry, the RV industry, the outdoor industry, the bike industry, those are all booming in the US right now because yeah. there are ways for people to recreate, there are ways for people to recreate and social be at social, at social distance. So there's uh, a lot of things, thankfully, that we are vested in, that we think there's gonna be a very sharp, there's already a recovery and we could see it uh, continuing. But, the, and the advertising business for media is gonna be tied to those things where uh, we, we think digital advertising, which is, uh, the, the easiest thing to put a stop to, we think will be the first thing people start coming back and investing in a uh, print will follow. Yeah. But I, I'm uh, reasonably optimistic that unless we see, which unfortunately at the moment we are, uh, a whole nother surge of the coronavirus, uh, at least in the US, everybody really wants to sort of get back to business, get back to recreating, get back to socializing, but it's uh, not proving to be sort of safe to come out from hiding uh, completely yet here. <laughs> it still feels a long way off, doesn't it? Uh, it does. Certainly from, from where I think we, you and I are sat, um, maybe a bit less so in New Zealand. Uh, a question from Alistair Hall. Alistair, thank you very much for your question. He says, hi, Andy. Uh, around branded editorial reviews. Is there a concern for you with the credibility of your reviews if you're making money on products sold on the basis of the review itself? So is there a kind of editorial credibility question there for you guys? There absolutely is. And, you know, we, we actually launched this program with one of our most celebrated editors. He was the National Magazine award-winning editor of Backpacker and the foremost gear sort of guru in the company and his his point of view is that he's think he thinks this is a phenomenal service to readers and the fact that we are not promising anybody a good review if they submit their products we will do the review if they like the review and it's positive by the way chances are someone's not going to submit a crappy product for a editorial yeah. test and review yeah and part of the challenge in the industries we're in is there is such product excellence and, and parity, you know, Patagonia and North Face, they make great products. Uh, so, you know, that's, we, we've, we think we've attended to that and, and uh, you know, kept our sort of editorial values and virtue intact, but re really important to have editors uh, and editorial sort of leadership in this so it doesn't go off, doesn't go off and become a pay to play kind of model. And they're acting as your guardians of the brand, your gatekeepers to make sure that everything stays on the level. And interestingly, they have been purchased. So I think we have probably 50 licensees of 50 reviews that we have done in the last month and a half. And in almost every, I think in every one of those conversations, one of, or the editorial person leading this program has been on the uh on the conversation with the brand fantastic um we need to wrap it up in a minute because we're almost out of time before we go i just wanted to ask you about the future um for enthusiast media and, and for aim more generally what's next for you guys yeah well we're we're continuing to 
you know, push on some of these major initiatives we've launched and uh, this whole mantra of turning both subscribers into members, but marketers into members. And one of the things that we have been doing alongside this idea of building these membership programs is uh, resetting the way we go to market from a marketing standpoint or, or marketer standpoint, I should say. So, uh, whereas before we have a big sales force out there selling media products and in some cases doing business with brands that in some cases we or these brands have done business with for 10, 20, 30, 50 years. Yeah. So we, we went back to the market and said, uh, and we launched this at equine very successfully instead of having this kind of very uh, sporadic relationship, why don't we have a much more strategic discussion about how we can bring to bear all of our products and assets in a much fuller relationship that might extend over one to three years. So let's, let's agree on the deal now once, and let's spend the next 12, 24 months working together to try to help you grow your business, which sounds, you know, it sounds cliche, but the things that we're doing are now we're deeply immersed in brand strategy and research and things that agencies have done historically while we're bundling media that we would have sold sort of a la carte and mm. creates a much bigger, stickier relationship. When we did this at equine, if you take the same brands that we are now doing these contracts with these marketing memberships with, we doubled the annual spend uh, that they'd been spending previously. Yeah. So that's, that's uh, continuing to push on that front, uh, build on this e-commerce reviews business, uh, continue to diversify in the membership offerings we have. So we have more than enough on our plate, but uh, always being mindful that what might have been a great idea two years ago, if it's not thriving, uh, you need to move to something else, which we've been gotten better and better at. Yeah, it's been a difficult time for those working in strategy and planning the last few months. <laughs> There's not really a lot you can plan for at the moment. Well, Andy, look, we're almost out of time. Thank you so much for that. It's been a really fascinating chat. I think Active Interest Media is such a great example of an enthusiast media business doing really innovative things and engaging with audiences. And I hope that's been useful for all of our friends and colleagues in New Zealand. So Andy, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, James. And uh, I do hope and look forward to visiting with uh, our colleagues and friends in New Zealand at some point in person, but wish you all, wish you all well in the, uh, in the meantime. Yeah. Fingers crossed we get the live version next year and you'll definitely be on the, on the, on the agenda. Don't worry about that. <laughs> Terrific. All right. Thanks. Have a good uh, late morning, early morning, James. Thanks Andy. See you. Um, for all of our delegates, New Zealand delegates, uh, thank you very much for joining this session. Uh, a reminder that we're bringing you these sessions in collaboration with our friends and partners at Press Reader. Uh, Press Reader is, if you don't know them already, one of the world's largest digital content distribution businesses and a big digital newsstand business as well. Steve Chapman from Press Reader is in the session today. I can see him in there, so hi to Steve. And Steve and his colleagues are in the deal room ready to have meetings with you. So if you want to know more about the Press Reader platform, I'm sure all of you have heard of it. But if you want to get into the nuts and bolts of how it works and what it can do for you, please do, do go and book a meeting with Steve. And of course, go and book a meeting with your fellow delegates. You'll be able to hear a bit more from Press Reader tomorrow as well, when Nikolai has a really fascinating presentation on content distribution during the time of COVID. So we're going to move on in the next five minutes to the next session, which is an exclusive interview with Sinead Boucher, the new owner of Stuff. Uh, that's going to be in the next Zoom session. If you look in the chat, the link is there for you to go into that session now straight away. It's also in your email, uh, and we look forward to seeing you there. Uh, I'm going to jump off now and come back on the other one and just uh, have a, a, a two-minute break, and then I will see you in the next session in a couple of minutes. But thank you for joining that and see you soon. Goodbye.